Okay, I'll be discussing the disadvantaged big identifying program and the equal opportunity to plot. The current statewide goal in Florida is 9.91%. And I also just cover some of the DBE, the objectives of the DBE program. Now, the equal op uh, we want to ensure equal opportunity in our award and administration of FDOP contracts. We want to make sure that they're equal for everyone. When we award them, in the way we carry them out also, we want to make sure that they're equal for smaller firms and everyone. Also, we want to level the playing field to promote competitiveness in our contracts. We want to make sure that our contracts give everyone an opportunity to compete. And one important thing, we want to make, it, make sure that FDOT DBE program complies <coughs> with all the applicable state laws. We want to make sure that all the laws are covered. So that's why so many documents, you might say, well, you have to do cuffs first, the certification process might tend to be a little bit longer. But we want to make sure that we're covering all the appropriate laws are covered in our certification process. Also, one important thing, we want to ensure the integrity of our certified DBE firms. We want to make sure that we're certifying DBE firms that's disadvantaged. You know, we want to make sure every firm that's certified meets the qualifications of disadvantaged business program. And we also want to ensure that they can perform the next coast that they're certified in. We want to give our prime contractors good DBEs, and we want to make sure that throughout the whole program, the integrity of certified IDB firms are met. And an excellent one. We want to move the uh, barriers in FDOT and participating on FDOT contracts. We want to say, hey, if you're a smaller firm, you can't, you don't exceed, like if you're not qualified as a prime contractor, we want to make sure that we give our smaller firms a chance to uh, participate in our contract. And one important thing is we want to make sure that all our firms are able to complete, not only in the marketplace, but in the marketplace and also successfully outside of the marketplace. When you get into the DBE program, we don't want firms to like come to the DBE program and stay in the DBE program forever. We want them to eventually be able to compete successfully outside of the DBE, pro DBE program, but in the marketplace. Because I have a lot of prime contractors once they build relationships with DBE firms, they get a little upset once that DBE firm graduates. And I have to kind of talk to them and say, hey, it's working, the program's working. That's the purpose of the program, to graduate these DBE firms. So we want to make sure that we're incorporating that. Also, I'll just, just the DBE program details, I'll just touch on that briefly. The statewide DBE goal for Florida is 9.91%. Uh, now, FDOT has uh, project-specific <coughs> DBE availability goals. And when I say project-specific, sometimes I have different prime, I have flight down here in Orlando house to a DBE event, and I had a prime contractor come up to me and say, we were just awarded this contract. Why did you guys put a 15% DBE availability goal in this contract? And the reason for that that contract, the work that's on that contract being let, we have a lot of DBEs certified in that area of work. So if you have something like landscaping, trucking, or just an area with a lot of DBEs certified in, that goal, tend, concrete, that goal tends to be slightly higher. So you might say, hey, the statewide goal is 9.91%, but on some of your contracts, the goal might be 15% of 12% DBE availability goal. And that's the reason for that. Okay, I'll touch on my next slide with the 49 CFR Part 26. We're going to touch a little bit. I have a slide just for that because that is so important because it governs our contract. So we'll just kind of go over it. Here's one that we like to just touched on, the FHW 1273, Section 11.10. That's also in our contracts. That's governing our contracts. So I have a slide, and we're going to touch on that a little bit, too. 
And it's one I'm sure all the prime contractors in the room probably heard about the standard specification 72, and you're probably familiar with that too. And we'll cover that and what that intake can tell you when we say, hey, we want you to do, we want to make sure that your contract is in our, running all the guidelines and qualifications with the standard specification 7-24. That's a very important document. How many of you are familiar with the uh, CF 49 Part 26-13B? How many of you are familiar with that? Michelle, I figured you would be, but do we have any more in here that's familiar with that? Okay, that's why. Right. With this, I told them to so my manager asked me to cover this. I said, you know, I hate to see this. people instruct, get up and read verbatim, you know, a PowerPoint presentation. But with this document, it's so important that if I just don't read it to you verbatim, I'm going to miss something that's important in it. And it's not something that you review every day, but it's so important because it's in every contract that you sign with the department. Also, it's in every contract that your subcontractor signed with the department. So we're just going to familiar, we're going to read it and brief it, but it's a good thing maybe that you just kind of familiarize yourself with that later on. <coughs> It's so important until it says, each contract you sign with a contractor, that's each contract you sign, not some, but just everyone you sign with a contractor, each subcontract, the prime contractor signs with a subcontractor, must include the following assurance. So it's just that important. Every contract includes this. The contractor, subrecipient, or subcontractor shall not discriminate on the basis of Color, national origin, or sex. So this is so important. This is carried. This is all our contract. I'll tell you in a few minutes how important it really is. Now, performance. When you are in the performance of this contract, the contract shall carry out the applicable requirements of the CF of the 49 CFR Part 26 in the award and administration of DOT assisted contracts. Now, failure to do this can mean in that termination, carry out this. You'll terminate, your contract can be terminated. It's just that important. So it's so important that you familiarize yourself with this because it's in every contract. And also, um, it's, it's a material breach of this contract, which may result in termination or such uh, other remedies or as the recipient deems appropriate. So this is like one that we just need to kind of be, if you're working on an FT, FDOT job in any capacity, it's real important that you familiarize yourself with this. You know, you can do this for yourself and for your company. So this is just a very important regulation in the contract. And like I say, I don't even provide it by heart, but sometimes I just keep it on the screen and I go to it and I refer to it. You know, like that. I'll touch on our FDOT Specification 7-24. And this is the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Affirmative Action Plan. I'm sure every private contractor here one time, probably when you entered your commitment into the EOC, you probably had that RCS of Phyllis Butler or the DCCM CM ask if you entered a commitment, you want to apply to a 9.91% and say you entered a low commitment into the EOC. So one of us probably came back to you and said, hey, can you tell me how you implement your DBE A affirmative action plan? And the reason we ask you this is because if we see where, hey, you know, you're only reaching like 2% on this 9.1% contract, we want to know what we can do to help you. But we want to know how you're implementing this plan. You sign this plan, and it's so important too, before you awarded a contract with the department, you have to have a approved plan. You have to make sure that you have this approved plan before we even award you the contract. So I think that's a very important uh, part of that contract. <clears throat> and another thing that's included in the 7-24, we have to verify that every prime contract has access to the EEOC system. We want to make sure this is part of it. You know, you, when you obtain a uh, contract with FDOT, and if we're looking around and you, you're not entering this stuff into the ELC, you have to verify that you have access to it because this is all governed in the standard 
uh, specification 7-24. And don't worry about like, taking a lot of notes with it because I think this is the PowerPoint. I'll show the driver something. Where it, can it, after today, it's going to be released on the uh, web. Well. Awesome, that's it. And it's so hard to remember. If it's like me, I just keep it on my desktop. And sometimes, sometimes I have to just click on it and just kind of familiarize myself with it too. You know, so it's like build an opportunity report. This is one of the requirements also to fall up under the standard specification 7-24. DBE reports and records. That's that's another one that falls up under. It. Commitments entered into the ELC. Man, that's the specification. That's why we can bring that back to you and say, how are you implementing your DBE program in accordance with the standard specification? We like that, because that covers a whole variety of everything. Monthly payments entered into the ELC. You're required to enter your monthly payments into the ELC. Also, adjustments now. <clears throat> also required, not just to get that information into the ELC, but you're also required to adjust that commitment anytime you add a new DBE firm that was originally added in that commitment that you entered. Also, with one of the departments, we hate to hit it, if you have to delete a DBE firm that you added. Or if you increase the dollar amount of work that that DBE firm will be performing. We like that one. But anyway, you're required to just adjust that you know as quickly as possible when you do that. And keep in mind, too, you can revise that DVE commitment at any time. So, you know, if you want to go in and if it's wrong, you can revise it at any time. We'll talk about using a one that you plan on keeping, but we'll discuss that on the next slide. Also, now, availability, I'm just walking around kind of because when I talk to one side of the room, I want to make sure I'm talking to everyone who feels left out. I have kids and, you know, we have to kind of cater to everyone. Um, also, now, the DVE availability goals are assigned to contracts, individual goals or not. And the reason for that, the department, we believe that we can achieve our, we can achieve our goals on our contracts through the normal competitive procurement process. And we want to try to, you know, it's really important we work with our prime contractors and do everything we can to try to achieve these goals. Because some states, like our Florida is a race neutral state. But you have a lot of states that's race conscious. And when you have those race con conscious goals on those contracts, it's like if you have, you're required, it's a little bit more cumbersome, you're required to like hire maybe uh, five, you know, two, of that goal, the 9.91% goal, you're going to have to have five black firms. Five Hispanic firms, five female firms, you know, and it's a little bit more cumbersome. So if we can work together just to keep the goals where they're individual goals, I think that uh, the availability goals, I think that will work better for us. So that's why the department we stress that we work together with, you, with our prime contractors to do everything that we can to try to achieve that. <clears throat> and again, you're going to see this a lot. Uh, the department encourages contractors to review and implement their DBEAA policy plan. We don't want to say, hey, when I start that new job with FDOT, they can check, and I have a DBE plan that's approved, you know, that's on site, so I don't see why that RCS is filled with the DCC and what we call it. No, we're going to call you. If we see that you're not implementing that plan, we're going to give you a call. And to implement that plan, you're saying when you sign it, I'm going to obtain um, bids and quotes from certified DBE firms and I got work to be subcontract out on this project. You know, you're telling us, hey, I'm going to level that clean field and I'm going to obtain business sort of certified coach from DB firms as well, and that's DB firms. So that's the implementing firm, your, your policy plan. Also, now, since this is a contract requirement, we're going to talk on just touching a little bit how to get access to the EOC. The first thing you need is a prime contract, you need a user ID and a password. What you need to complete, who knows the three items that you complete in order to obtain a user ID and a password? Anyone in here know can tell me what three items that you should complete in order to do so? No problem? I got it, I'll tell you. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> you need an EO access form. That's the first thing you need. A security form, 
And I like this third one because this third one is where you have to complete a computer <coughs> uh, security awareness CBT. And once you complete that CBT, you're required to submit that form, uh, the certificate in. So we don't want you just to say, hey, I completed that, now I can gain access to the EOC. No, once you complete it, that you're required to submit that certificate to the EOO Health Desk at this address. Also, I have the link, like Dennis said, he's going to place it. So the link for you to obtain the forms will be, you know, like you obtain the access forms and all the forms that I'm discussing will be available to you. Now, the EOC system is like a uh, web-based application, and it's designed to uh, manage, believe it or not, to manage the DBE program. And this ensures compliance with DBE and MBE reporting. This is one thing that's good for the contractors, and it's also good for the department. And uh, also now, for you to, uh, when you eat in the EOC, it's a statewide module. So you can't say, hey, I'm going to leave D5. I don't like that EOC thing. And they always asking me to put those payments in. This program is statewide. So whether you go to Pensacola, move to Miami, you're still going to have to use the EOC system because it's a statewide base. And anyone know like the following forms that you need, you know, that's required to be reported into the EOC? Anyone know one form that's required to be reported into the EOC? Okay, I got that for you too, I can cover it. You're required to enter your bid opportunity list. And one of the problems we were having like on a lot of contracts, I don't know if the problem was to enter that bid opportunity list into the EOC, but it is a required document. So you're required to do so. CBE commitments, you're required to enter them into the EOC. All DBE and MBE sub payments are required to be entered into the EOC. We'll discuss this a little bit more on the next slide. Also now, <clears throat> prime contractors and consultants, all, they're responsible for reporting on the following type of contracts. Do you just have to report this information on, you know what contracts, anyone know what contracts you're required to report on? Is it just construction contracts? <coughs> all of them, thank you, thank you, thank you. Any FDLP contracts, I'll just tell them thank you. All contracts, that was correct. Construction, maintenance contracts, professional services, also, if you just say, I'm going to just do local lab project projects, you're still required to report this information on a local agency project. So if you just say, I don't want to be bothered with all that the department going, I'm just doing local agency, you're required to report this on local agency projects as well. Now, this is just a little quick uh, snapshot of uh, DOC, the things that you're required to do, like just a little step that you're required to follow. The first thing you need to do is log into the ESC, set up a sub-agreement for DBE and MBEs, subs, report DBE commitments for DBE subs, and also report DBE and MBE payments monthly. You're required to report these payments on a monthly basis for all DBEs and MBEs that's working on the project. Every month you pay them, you're required to go into the EOC and report that payment. And that helps the department, too. Because if you start out with a contract that's just say um, $200,000, every month that you make that payment, that RCS that monitors that project, she knows the payments are being made and you're getting closer and closer to the percentage that you entered on the DPE commitment. So that's a very important thing. Because believe me, the DCCM Dennis is going to have them, he look at it and he review it and call, he's going to say, hey, what's going on here? You know, this project could be over this amount of time, and there's no payments, or it's only two. You know, do they need help? You know, are they still utilizing the DBE? So when you do it monthly, it's really, it, it, that's the way, that's the requirement to be done on, on a monthly basis. That good bid opportunity list, that's the first one we were having, like a lot of times that was not, uh, was not in compliance with it. Believe it or not, now, you, within three business days of the submission of the bid proposal, you're required to enter this bid opportunity list in the EOC. Good question. How long do you have to submit this bid opportunity list? Do you have throughout the life of the contract? 
How many days do anybody know how long you have before you're required to submit this into the EOC? Three. Did I hear someone? Some people ask Okay, if you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll let you know how many days. Because like I said, this is one area problem that we had, so I think a lot of clients was, wasn't aware of this. You have nine days, you have 90 days from the close uh, of that execution date on that contract to submit this. And guess what, if you don't submit it, you're non-compliant, but you have 90 days. So you don't want to wait and just say, I'll just do it, no one told me to do it, or that RCS, I have to even catch it, it's not there, so I'm going to wait. You're required to do it within 90 days from that execution date on that contract. So that's not really a lot of, a lot of time if you think about it. Yeah. Let's just Okay, now, and before setting up that bill of opportunity, because I kind of like this one, you're required to go in and set up a subcontractor list. <clears throat> and the subcontractor looks, this is something like, you know, a little black book that you use. Once you go into that system and you set that subcontractor list up, you're only required to do this one time. So I don't care if you have like 10 projects with the department, go into it, set it up, you can reuse it. You can just go in there one time and just reuse the subcontractor list. Or well, I can see if you need commitment. If you want to succeed with this, you'll have to do it. Now, you're required to submit that DBE commitment into the EOC. You should do this prior to the pre-construction conference, or you can do it at the pre-construction conference. But it's a good thing, just a good practice to do it prior. Because you might like one good thing, you can contact your RCS, myself or the DCPM, if you need to locate DBEs in a certain area. Because if you're going to wait for the day of the uh, pre-construction conference, there's a lot going on. But what we can do is send you a list of the appropriate DBEs that your subcontract can work out to. So if you're just making a practice, maybe to do it prior to the pre-construction conference, that would be a good thing. But you can do it at the pre-construction conference. It's just so common I had one of my RCS, when she read my PowerPoint staff, she said, just have them do it before. Because you know at the pre-construction conference, there's so much going on and you're not going to be able to compile the list and use the percentage, you know, you might can look for a certain area, but if you do it before, we'll, we'll help you find DVDs. Myself, the supportive services, we can help you find the appropriate DVDs for the subcontract work. So that's a good thing to do it before. So make sure you use a realistic uh, commitment that you plan on achieving. You know, you can revise this commitment at any time throughout the life of that project. But just kind of use a realistic one. If you make any adjustments to your commitment, positive or ne negative, we ask that you do so as quickly as possible. And one of the reasons for this is that, again, if you if say you had a DVE, firm that you were planning on utilizing, and for some reason you won't be able to utilize that DBE firm. If you do it really quick, you can contact your RCS or DCCM or myself. We can probably maybe replace that firm, that firm with another DBE firm that performs the same kind of work. And also, we want to make sure our numbers, we don't want you to keep it. You know, I'll, I'll touch that a little bit on the uh, other slide, but just positive and negative, just do so as quick as possible, even positive. When you do a policy, that helps us capture that percentage you're going to use. So that's a good thing. We all know we have to post those monthly payments into the EOC. <clears throat> Again, try to make sure you post monthly payments. And this is also an advantage to the contractor because it helps you with your percentage. You know. Also, I'll touch on just using actual DVE payments. Um, the department reporting period is from October the 1st to September the 1st. And just say, if you went into the ELC, you say, hey, I'm starting this project with DFT and at this pre convening what I'm going to do is, I'm going to tell that RCS and tell Bob that I'm going to have a $2 million commitment on here, which is going to give me a DBE percentage of 12%. In actuality, you know, you say, maybe I can just start this project with all these phone calls and emails and asking you to do this. In actuality, you know, okay, you just put $2 million, and when that project is over, your DBE participation might be a million dollars. So we're going to start that new <coughs> negative a million. 
And just keep in mind, if you do this, and we have like 50 other prime contractors that do the same thing, our yearly, right now I think our yearly uh, percentage for D5 might be close to like 12% for construction. I might be a little bit off, I should probably check it, but maybe 12%. But if you do this, and um, we have five, six other contractors do it, we're going to start that year out at a negative, our 12% probably going to drop right at the beginning of that year to 5 to 3%. And it's going to be really hard for us to bounce back from that. We want for you to just use a realistic commitment and just adjust it as we go. You know, you can just say, hey, I'm going to put in 100000 but I really think I can uh, achieve uh, 500000 Just adjust it as we go. And that way we can keep more of a realistic thing. Also, just, you know, from best practices, just, you know, uh, talking to some of our prime contractors and just kind of watching the prime contractors. We have some prime contractors almost always achieve that 9.91% goal or higher. And so we just kind of say, hmm, let's just brainstorm this and let's see what they're doing to achieve it, you know, so we can just go ahead and incorporate it. So you guys are lucky because we're going to share this with you. You know, we kind of compiled and we're going to share it with you. Always review your DBE 8 a policy plan and implement your plan. Like I said again, when you implement this plan, you're, you're taking bids and quotes from certified DBE firms, you're uh, contracting the department, and you're looking for DBEs when you have subcontract opportunities. You're implementing that plan. Also, consider DBEs and SBEs during the bidding process. You know, if you know at the time for, to, uh, for the bidding process and you look, you say, hey, we have out 20, doing 20 uh, subcontract items on this project. We haven't received any bids or quotes from certified DBEs. That's a problem. Consider doing the bidding process. Right then, you should get on the phone with uh, your RCS, and I'm sure your RCS will contact me. And if I can't locate them, we're going to do the supportive services. But let us know. Say, hey, we want some bids from some DBE firms. We have this landscaping, we have this trucking, or whatever area you have it. Just consider doing the bidding process. That way, Hey, read right that pre-construction meeting, you're going to have that DBE commitment ready. Document your solicitation uh, results. For, uh, you know, document this. Why would you document these results? You know, what, for what reason do you want to say, hey, I contact five DBEs and I have 20 other, you know, regular subcontract firm, firms and out of five DBEs, I was only able to uh, contract out to one. Why would you want to document your efforts? Did anybody know? In the event that you don't meet your goal, you have something to be able to show that you actually did good faith. Thank you so much. That's amazing. I said, good thing. You document it. Because when Dennis Kirk believes he's going to do it, he's going to have the RCSs or myself <coughs> ask, say, how do they implement that DBE program? You know, they're not meeting these goals. So are they obtaining bids and pros from certified DBEs? You know, or do they just say, okay, what if, you know, we're not going to do it, whatever, and I got away with it on four of the contracts, and that's it. Like why did you just say Document it. If you document it, you can say, hey, I'm going to just put this file over to Dennis and to Phyllis and the RCS, and they can see these efforts that I put out there. So, you know, and that's one thing, document it. Think outside the typical construction box. When I say this, because my step two, when I first started the DVD program, I was thinking, man, hey, I come up with trucking firms. I have to come up with concrete DVDs. I have to come up with landscaping if it's a landscaping contract. Think outside that box. We have some excellent DBE fuel providers. Excellent. We have some excellent DBE suppliers. Also, you can think like if you're on this contract with FDLT and this contract Pacific, you can use a drug testing company. You can say, hey, with this contract that I have here, I'm going to test probably about 10, 20 new employees working this contract. Use a DBE drug testing firm. And also you can um, think outside the box again. You can use a janitorial firm. If you have like so, you know, so many setups, because Michelle and I was working with a summer project, and they were a little late with giving us the correspondence because they were trying to set up a module with trailer. So with that module trailer, just think if they need someone to clean that module trailer, because it's for that project. They can hire a janitorial uh, DBE service you know, to do so. And so that's kind of thinking outside the typical construction box.
I love this from here now. <laughs> Pass along your DBE uh, availability to your subcontractors. When you strive that subcontract sub agreement, pass along. If I'm a subcontract firm on here, you can say, hey, Phyllis, we're giving you 20% of work on this firm. We have a 10% DBE available to go. What we want you to do is come up with 2%. When you subcontract out the work that you have, we want you to help us meet this goal. We want you to bring us 2% in. So kind of passing it along is an awesome <coughs> idea to do. And then you can have the other one that you're doing, you might be doing like the 10%. Say, so, hey, I signed the subcontract agreement with you, so I want you to give me 1%. You know, just kind of, we don't, the department, not only we breach it contract specific, we don't care how you reach that goal. And you like employing the other subcontract, why not pass along the goal? And this works too, because I have a lot of people doing that, they pass along that goal. <coughs> Contact the department, which is myself, Dennis Kirk, and the RCS staff uh, for, for assistance. If you can't locate DPE in a certain area, contact us. You can say, hey, I need you to help me find DPE in this area and believe that we have like three or four support, supportive services that we can do this for. Mm -hmm. Quick question. This one here say, refer DBE or potential DBE firms uh, for assistance to the department. Why would you refer a DBE firm already, a certified? Why would you refer them to the department? Anyone knows? Just this year alone, I had two DBE firms certified in another state. I had the prime contractor shoot me over an email and say, hey, Phyllis, we have this firm we use on all our projects. We use them on the project that was awarded to us. But they're certified in, I think it was North Carolina, and the other one was certified in another state. Can you assist them through the process? I jump right on it because what we do, you think, and, it's a, and the process is a little bit less cumbersome for them because it's an after data, and then you just have to submit the application that you receive certification to another state. So if you have a DBE to certify another state, but you're using them, let's get them certified in Florida so we can use that toward that goal. Also, you might want to refer a DBE firm stating, hey, I, I, I obtained five bids from DBE firms, and like two of them I'm considering, but the other two, the bidding process, I don't know if they really uh, the bidding, if they really understand the bidding process or what. You can contact me. I'll have my support of Dennis Kirk or the RCS. And what we can do is have our support services assist them through that bidding process. Or if they have it or any other area, but that's a good one. And that way we can say, okay, we can we need to, they can assist them and kind of help them to kind of level the playing field to get that bid correctly and get them in the door so you can you can consider that. Also, uh, I love this one too. I have like a, uh, four DBE firms. One I'm waiting for on site, but two of them certified. I had the firm prime contract refer them to me. Uh, one guy, was, one prime was using this uh, minority business for seven years on his project. And he goes, I've been asking him for like five years to become DBE. First, he did count him on the DBE thing. He wasn't certified just because he was a minority. He thought maybe he was already DBE certified. But he referred him to me to assist him. And one I assist, and one was out of Fort Lauderdale, he does work in D5, so I gave him to the support services to assist him. So that way, we can certify them and uh, start gaining credit for them on our D5 project. So that's an awesome thing. And when you look around and see, hey, every time we sign this small, then somebody going over my client, I don't want to do that. But every time we sign this small contract, we've always used this minority business. Let's get that minority business certified. That way you can, um, Get credit for that. So that's a good way to do it. Now, thank you. And what questions do you have for me? And if you don't have any questions right now, what you can do is Dennis is going to let you write them down and we can uh, answer them. Also, Dennis, is there anything that you want to cover that maybe I didn't touch on? Well, you touched on quite, quite a little bit. There's a few things I want to okay. emphasize. Uh, when getting access to EOC, how many people have been locked out of EOC? <laughs> it happens. And you know when it happens? The day of the pre-con. Yes. So guess what? You didn't hear your commitment, you go to the pre-con, sorry, I don't have access. That's not a good way to start the project. So get your commitments in as early as feasible. Make sure you confirm your access. And one of the things we've been running into over the past year is as positions change within companies, um, the uh, person who used to have EOC access move to another department, bus company, whatever, but their log on information is still available. If somebody else picks it up and has to log on, 
and it doesn't happen, you may email the help desk, e e o o help, hey, I'm having trouble logging on, and they see an email address that's not connected to that access information, what's the, what's the next step to take? You're not supposed to share that information. Right, so just, just a tip on it. Make sure that if, if roles are changing, if you're the only person you're getting from the EOC, you're the one who's getting those uh, access information. And don't, yes, the spec says at or before the street con, you have to commitment center. I don't recommend waiting until the day of the uh, Even if you have no DPEs under subcontract yet, put zero in some pictures and we can help you work from the preset zero up to 9.91 or higher. Uh, Phil stressed the DBEAA DBE plan several times. Who's required to have the DBEAA plan? Everybody? Anybody doing business with that DOT? I have it. How long is it good for? Three, three years. Three years. So keep watching. My, my liaison officers in there, DB liaison officers, keep, keep tabs on that. At least three years you've got to resubmit a new one. A part can be the same one that you just, just uh, updated. Better opportunity list. That's important on an annual prediction for federal highway of what kind of work is what is somebody <coughs> in the state. DBE, non-DBE doesn't matter. Prime contractor, what kind of work are you looking to subcontract on this project? And you enter that in the bidder's opportunity list. You can list DBEs, you can list non-DBEs in there as well, and that helps us in Federal Highway capture, okay, in this fiscal year, concrete companies are, are, are a big thing for some reason, or uh, guardrail companies, or whatever it is. That's the importance of the Federal Opportunity List, and that's our agreement with Federal Highway, is that we provide that opportunity for you all to enter, enter the uh, Federal Opportunities so that we can report to them, here's what we're subcontracting out in the state of Florida. So that's real critical and not a lot of people use it. Uh, timely payments, stress those real quick. Monthly payments, I get the specification off the top of my head, I think it's 9-14, uh, progress payments, timely payments, something like that. You need to be, if, if you get an invoice, make sure that you're in your DVD payments and make sure that they match your invoice amount. If it's a trucking company, Make sure that your trucking certification that they submit to you matches those payments for that month. Because that's what the RCS is confirming. That all the payments are legitimate, they all match, and they're entered in a timely fashion. Um, yep, that, that fills pretty much cover everything. Any questions before we go on? Yes. Um, I had someone to ask me just recently about uh, the financial aspects where you have to have, I think it's not over a million dollars net. It's 1.3, 32 million, 1.3. Well, they were confused. They were wanting to know, I told them that, but my house, my car, my business, it's excluding your home and your business. It's excluding your 1.32 million, it's excluding your home and your business. So that, I, I tried to explain that, but they still didn't. Have them call us. Have them call us. Yeah, yeah, and and call. you can contact us, or, or they should contact Central Office, or whoever their certifying authority is. Or, 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 contact that authority so they can provide the current details. We can do that, but we're not the certification authority. We, we uh, just can provide the information to get them hooked up with people that should be the certification. Okay. Make sure they explain well, if there are any more questions before we move to the Sure. How can you refer a DBE to for the required EEO documentation? You know, when you uh, as I give them out uh, the documentation, the contract says 10,000 that I need all these documents, and it's like deer in the headlights in some instances. And who can we refer them? Because so many of them, or a few of them, are standard. EEO, AA plans, you know, EEO officer. Who, who, who helps yeah. find DBEs? For any DBE companies out there, and we realize they're small companies. You know, it's uh, a truck driver, and that's it sometimes, right? <laughs> and, but you're responsible for all these compliance documents. If you're having that issue, you can contact your RCS, contact Phyllis, or contact me. And also, we have some pamphlets over there. We have a, a consultant firm that works for the state, it's a, a support services, 
they actually do classes for DBE firms on how to manage your business, how to select, how, what, what you need to provide payrolls, uh, what's it mean to do DBE reporting, what, what's it mean to do all of your, uh, our, your EEO reporting requirements, reports and forms that you need to fill out. So we, we can provide assistance, our support services can provide more detailed assistance, and it's no charge to you. So, you know, contact us, or get one of those, and then do a form refer to the support services. Or, hey, call us and say, hey, I'm having problems with whatever. I know they're busy. They can't get me these things. We'll refer them to support services. Yeah, they have them small, contact. and it's not yeah. the man. Yeah. Yeah, he is, he is it. Yep, yeah. yeah. So that's a good question, and we hear that quite often. You know, a small company, or they just got certified, first federal project, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, so that's what we're here for is to help them out. Okay? All right, well, with that, we're going to move, shift focus a little bit to, uh, from DDEs to trucking operations. How many, how many construction projects out there have no dump trucks working on it? <laughs> Boy, we got a treat for you. We're gonna change that. 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 We're gonna FDOT standard classification 8-1 dash 2, which is contractual agreements and rental agreements. In chapter 2 and 6, they combine something else. So if you need references to where I'm pulling the information from, that's where you're going to find them. Okay, let's just step through this. Each truck, DBE or non-DBE, must be authorized to work on a project being executed contractual agreement. The contract includes subcontractors, rental agreements, and so forth. I've seen trucks on purchase orders, lease agreements, some kind of contractual document that says, yep, I agree that they're supposed to be working on that. And typically, you're reporting subcontracts on certification subject to the department, or you're, if you're renting trucks, you're reporting on the, uh, truck, the vehicle rentals on a notice of rental agreement. That's your notification to the department, hey, I've got these people working out there in this capacity. So there's two different things. There's a notification process, and there's the actual contractual document. Okay, all subcontracts must include 1273. Can it be just the first page of 1273? Can it be just a reference of 1273? It has to be all 12 pages. And be careful, some people retype the 1273. I don't know why, but they retype it. And they leave out certain sections of it. Well, the federal highway is going to come talk to me if they see that. Say, how come you're letting them do that? So, we randomly review subcontracts, a lot of those, to make sure 1273 is included. Reference to the waste decision, if it's applicable. Scope of trucking operations, are they hauling on site? Are they hauling off site? Are they dropping low? Are they a water truck somewhere that's providing more? What's the scope of the trucking operations? And commissions or fees, dollar amount and the are in that rate. Commissions or fees, fees apply. Make sure that that's detailed in that contractual agreement. And that helps us determine as we get closer to DDE work what, what the DDE is actually providing to be counted for credit towards the DDE's pay. Must be authorized prior to the beginning of work on the project. Yeah, I think I'm going to have this trucking company start. And one of my RCS or Tracy calls three months later, hey, I saw a truck out there. Oh, yeah, we've got to get a subcontract in place. No, we need kind of that before they start out. So that they're authorized to work on the project. Okay, compliance documents. Working or hauling within the project limits on site, right? Getting up from point A, going to point B, but not leaving the project. Okay, they need a subcontract or rental agreement. Reported in the certification subway with no surrender agreement. EEO applies if it's $10,000 or more in work. What's that mean? EEO applies. They got to be on the whole people, right? And all the documents you just talked about, they need to be able to provide upon request. Certified payrolls required. They said, and uh, there's some exceptions to that. Subject to trucker interviews to confirm DBE and owner operator status. Trucker interviews. Who does trucker interviews? <coughs> Who? Our, 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 
Yeah, the SES, the tractor, the PA, the department does a tractor, or it's actually called tractor observation and verification. The form we use, come out there and say, okay, Mr. Mr. Trucker, and you see your license, registration, who you work for, good to go, what do you deserve doing while I'm hauling on site? Okay, if you're hauling to and, to and from the project, somewhere off site, coming from an off site place, on the project, or vice versa, going picking up the green, milling everything, hauling away. Subcontract again, reporting on certification, self the rental agreement. Okay. You know that. Subject to trucker interviews to confirm DBE and owner operator status. And at the DBE, that we're going to be doing trucker observations and verifications. And the reason we do trucker observations and verifications, especially on DBEs, is we have a responsibility to confirm that that DBE is performing a commercially useful function. We call it a cop. Okay, so that's how we determine for trucks. Are they performing a commercially useful function? Do they own and operate the truck? Do they control the scope of work? Are they under subcontract? And are they actually doing what the subcontracts are supposed to be doing? And are they certified in that area to make that happen? Okay, now we'll move into owner operators, truck owner operators. Real quick, a definition of a truck owner operator. Who's, who's that one out there? What constitutes a truck owner operator? Well, that would be a, a, the owner of the truck <coughs> and also operates it. Okay. He owns a truck, owns and operates a truck, he or she, right? Can he let somebody else drive that truck? And maintain owner operator status? Unless they own. No. No, no, they can't. No. So, if I own a truck and I'm the owner operator and I'm not sick, I need to get somebody else in, I got my buddy over there that's going to be a truck driver for the day. I'm no longer the owner operator, that person is subject to certified payroll. Okay? Okay, owners of trucks. A couple, couple of requirements here. If owners of trucks have incorporated and they own at least 20% of the business, participate in management of the business to day to day management, and are not hiring drivers outside of the corporate owners are eligible for bona fide truck owner operator status. And if that's the case, if they meet these requirements, they can be listed on the, on the, on their sub, whoever they're subcontracted to can be listed on their payroll. That's what we're operating. I'm getting correct now. Okay. Once they hire outside the corporate owners, then they must submit certified payrolls for all their employees. So that owner switches, switches from the subcontracted person to the subcontracted to you for the submission of certified payrolls. If during the uh, truck observation verifications, when we're out, we're out there and we stop the truck, they can see all this information. No, sorry, you're not the owner of record on this truck, and we don't have a payroll, then we move through the payroll violation process. The prime contractor may need the submission of the payroll for this, and here's our basis for, for, for making this happen. And the question is submission of the certified payroll reflecting all the required data elements and an hourly rate on the wage table for the type of truck operator. Okay, contractors are responsible. Whoever you're subcontracted to, contractors are responsible for ensuring accurate reporting of bona fide owner operators. How do you do that? Contracting a contractor may report the bona fide truck owner operator and certified payables if they acquire and obtain documentation to the operator's ownership for the truck. What's the best way to do that? Vehicle registration, right? Yep. It's you, you own this truck, nobody else does. And they have a valid basis for assuring that only the owner is operating the truck on a specific project. Okay, so that's when the contracting contractor can report them and maintain reporting them on their payroll. Again, if we go out there and somebody else is driving your truck, then we're going to need certified data. Okay, and is that acceptable valid basis for verifying this? You can put that in your subcontract. Somebody's on subcontract with Dennis, you put it there, only Dennis can drive that truck on site. Okay, I sign it, that's my contractual agreement. If I violate that, somebody needs to file. Or what they have to do is they can sign by the owner of the truck. 
I agree. I'm the only one that's going to operate this truck through the registration and supply that to the contracting contract. Okay, documentation is valid based on subject to verification, should be retained by this contractor for a minimum of three years. And we typically request these if we have a, a, an issue or some kind of a conflict with what we're seeing out there. Okay, it's important. Does anybody have any questions on this section right here on our page? Anybody have any comments? Any questions? Yeah. When they submit this letter, do they, how long is that letter good for? One year? When they sign that letter and give it to the truck? It should be while they're under subcontract. Or, 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 yeah. Yeah. There are certain documents, compliance documents, that take two or three years. It's mostly USD oil and Okay. Okay. Well, the only other thing would be if the vehicle registration that's linked in the ownership expires within a year. That's and good if point. Too. Yeah. If the, if the registration year. expires, well, then that's, that's the date that's extended by the letter. Here's my certification letter, my affidavit. Here's my registration that expires six months into your subcontract. Somebody should be saying you need to get this registered and submitted by the letter. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So you just can't redo the registration and the letter's going to be okay. It can't. They're both hand in hand. That's, that's going to be that's going to be up to the contract. Yeah. Okay. But what Marla, the point Marla's bringing up, and Jessica just brought it up also at the same time, is that it's if we come and we have an issue and we ask you for that documentation, it's going to be up to you to provide something current. So whether or not you require them to redo their application statement or you just request a new copy of their registration and put it with the file, that, that's going to be up to you. And I will dictate that process to you. But we'll be looking to see that you know that they have a current valid registration along with their statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, trucking firms. Many certified payrolls. Truckers, trucking firms that work for all within the project limit, within the project, must submit weekly payrolls. There's a form that we provide. We don't have to use this form, but the information on this form has to be on whatever format that you submit. And uh, that includes a wage and hour record and that statement of compliance. Certified payrolls due to FDOT seven days after the contractor's pay date. If not, you're probably going to get a some uh, notification from your RCS and this is the late payroll for these people working on the project seven days after the contractor's payroll. And typically the RCS when they set up projects, they reach out to everybody, hey, can you tell me what your week ending and pay date's going to be for each of your prime and your subcontracts? It's important that they get that information. If they don't get that information, then we have to assume on the first payroll that's going to be your pay date throughout the whole project. People come back and say, no, no, that's all wrong. You no, didn't tell us anything. So we have to make the decision. Okay. Hey, owner operators. If they're an owner operator, if they matches, that person's right, and that truck is ready to do that. They can, they can be listed on a brief, our, our abbreviated certified payroll can be used. It includes the owner's full name and the note, owner operator. And none of the other data items, hours, rate, deductions, they're not required if you're a true or a bond by a former operator. Again, the RCS comes up for the trucker observation and verification. You no, know, that's not the person that's uh, owned that truck that's driving it, then you're probably going to get a pure violation. Okay, okay. Uh,
It is on the FDOT forms website. Um, the certification, it, it is a formulated spreadsheet. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and it's always due the following month after the hauling. So they report it on a monthly basis, and then the following month they submit it to the RCS. <laughs> As you can see down here, there's um, this is the trucking certification form, and like I said, it's due at the beginning of the month, and any with the uh, the invoice period is on a monthly period. And full credit for the DBE that owns the truck and other DBEs, trucking firms that are hauling for that DBE. Non-DBE trucking activity receives partial credit, OBE credit. Um, well, again, I said this form is uh, the Excel spreadsheet is on the FDOT website. Um, it is on a 12 month basis. There's also the instructions on how to complete the FDOT form or certificate. And we're just going to kind of run through it real quick. Um, like I said, the invoice period is a, always a monthly basis. Um, I, I just used April as an example. Um, the far left hand side is the prime contractor's name, the DBE trucking firm, and all the contract information. You list only on the left-hand side the trucking DBE firms, no OBEs. And it, it automatically calculates, so as you see, I put the 1920, and it populates automatically over here for your invoices. And Tracy, just, just if you're not familiar with the term OBE, that's other business enterprise, that's non-DBE truckers. Because we know that happens, and if you hire a DBE trucker, they bring in some more help, and they may not be DBE firms, but they're still performing trucking operations, then they get lists rolled up under the OBE or other business enterprise report. There is under the trucker? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Um, another thing we see a lot is as the start and finish date. The start date is the first month that they are active on the project. The end date, the finish date, is to be left blank until the final month that they're done hauling. On, as Dennis was saying, OBE, other business entities, trucking dollars, um, you list all of them together. Where? Right there. There's a little star, bottom left hand side. Um, the 9130, and as you see in the blue box, it also calculates it to the total invoice. But the DBE credit remains the same as the 1920. Um, if there is commission from the other OBEs, you would put it uh, again linked together um, on the bottom left hand side. And it also calculates over on the right hand side. And this is going to be a running total for every month they do the spreadsheet. Contractor, you know, identifying those commissions now, so they don't have any. Uh, if they want to capture it at the end, just I mean, obviously, when you've got multiple layers, the whole when trucking world, they're pulling commissions, which is how the upstairs are making their money, you know. But I just see a lot of times that trucking starts coming in with no, nothing in the commission line, <coughs> which is a part of the percentage calculation as far as the DD credit. Just, I don't know if y'all have had any recent discussions with trucking truckers as far as reminding them of that or identifying that commission portion. They don't always seem to be breaking it out. Well, exactly. And and what, what we're reminding, I'll, I'll say this, we don't see a lot of commissions, but maybe that's because it's being not broken out. But that's what should be specified in a contractual agreement. Here are the commissions or the fees that apply, and then those get reported in that category on the trucking certification. 